Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin. Christina, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Christina Limbo. Welcome to today's webcast, Optimizing Your Online Reputation and Credibility. This event is brought to you by Martindale Nolo and presented by The American Lawyer. Before we begin, let's go over some basic housekeeping items about the webcast console. This event is completely interactive and incorporates many of today's social media tools. You can tweet or directly post information to your Facebook or LinkedIn pages right from the console. You don't have to open a new browser to do so. Just scroll along the bottom of the screen and click on the social networking widget of your choice. We encourage you to do so. If you have a question for one of our speakers, please enter it in the Q&A widget on your console. We'll get to your question during the event or during the live Q&A at the end, depending on how much time we have. We'll answer as many questions as possible, so we invite you to ask away. If we don't get to your question, you may receive an email response. In addition, there are some other customizable functions to be aware of. Every window you currently see, from the slide window to the Q&A panel, can be either enlarged or collapsed. So if you'd like to change the look and feel of your console, go right ahead. We do also have several resources available for your download in the Resources tab of your console, including a copy of today's presentation and several scorecards that you can use. So please visit the Resources tab and make sure to download those. Now let's get to today's topic and why you're all here today. Before making a decision, consumers often go online for research. That includes when it comes to hiring new lawyers. That means you need to be easy to find and showcase the information that matters most in terms of helping consumers assess you and your practice. The foundation of your legal practice rests on your reputation and the trust that it generates. Discussing with us today how to assess and enhance your online identity and reputation and position yourself the way you want to be perceived are Stephen Giovinko, founder of Recover Reputation, W.R. Samuels Esquire, founder of W.R. Samuels Law, and Brian Dieter Esquire, ratings and reviews product manager for Martindale Hubble. Before I hand it over to Stephen, though, we asked you, have you ever looked yourself up on Google, a.k.a. Googled yourself? Here are the responses to that question. And then we also asked you, do you currently have an online reputation? And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Steve. Great. Thanks so much. Um, you know, it's great to see all these positive numbers out there, but I just want to talk about what is your online reputation, and it really encompasses a lot of things. It's really everything about you online, and that includes your website, uh, reviews, your business or even personal blogs, images, videos, articles, uh, presentations, and comments about you from sites or blogs or comments that you write. And lastly, like social media posts, chatter. But the one thing I really want to drive home is a major point is that everyone has an online reputation, whether they think they do or not, and whether that online reputation is the absence of one. So way back in the pre-Internet days, there was more control over what was said about you. But now the Internet is the new first impression. Clients Google you when you're speaking on the phone. Really anyone can say anything. It shows up online, shows up really quickly online or it can. And people don't ask for references anymore. They search Google. And what I mean is uh, by the law of attraction is that clients are looking for something that solves their problem. And if you have a blog, an article, or a strong online presence that solves it, they are more likely to reach out to you. So let's look at what happens if something negative happens. If, something, if there's a negative online uh, appearance, especially if it occurs on the first page of Google search results, you know, simply clients or prospects stop calling. Negative information can discourage potential customers from initially contacting you or working with you again. And some lawyers may think that they are immune since much of their work comes from word of mouth or referral and that a bad online reputation is not harmful to them. And this, this could be true or this could partially be true. It's really something that's really changing. It's more people, more clients are accustomed to searching online for information before they work with someone, before they work with a professional. That includes lawyers. And I just want to bring up one thing that's really interesting. Uh, according to a Convergis Corporation study, 
one single online review can cost uh, one negative online review can cost a firm an average loss of about 30 clients or customers. And I know this just in my uh, working with other clients because I know of a case where there was uh, one disgruntled client wrote something negative on an anonymous posting site, uh, ripoffreport.com, and that sole partic- pr- practitioner lost about $200,000 from that one negative link. So it really means business. And also, if a client or prospect searches Google for information about a firm, but finds little information there, no articles written about them, minimal LinkedIn presence, no Twitter activity, no blog posts, the prospect could or probably will move on to someone else because they are not perceived as an expert in their field. So having a good online reputation builds trust and helps convert prospects to customers. So uh, here's just going to take a look at this and not go into too much detail, but here are some ways to gauge an online reputation and how long it might take to repair and what is the anticipated effort and resources necessary for the project. And it's, it can be as simple as just simply, you know, no magic here, like just look yourself up on Google. You know, what do you see? What's there? And candidly assess what appears. Um, and you can use this scorecard to assist you, and this is something that you can download. And then here, again, not to go into too much detail, but here's something that I use, and this is for an actual client. Uh, it's for repairing an actual issue, but here I looked at a bunch of things, actually 10 points. Uh, so the first is the relative number of links. How many positive or damaging links appear on the first page of, of Google search? What is the strength of those links? How strong are those articles, news sites, newspapers, government sites, or with high traffic? Because those um, are valued higher by Google. Position of these on the search page. Where do they show up? The top, the bottom. Lack of positive content. Is there very little other, other positive content? General interest in this issue. Lack of social media platforms. Uh, lack of web development, if, if there is a website, uh, you know, is it there, is it showing up? Um, social media optimization is something else I look at. Social media comments, activity, and the number of those comments. So w- w- really the best way to build a positive online reputation is to create good information and share frequently in the right places. Flooding the Internet with quality content shows your expertise or pushes negative piece off the first page. And there are many components to your reputation, as I mentioned earlier, including the firm's site, social platforms, content, even webinars like this. But I'm just going to briefly talk about four major ways to optimize what is said about you. So research and analyze. Uh, your reputation, generate positive content, share that, take that, and share that on industry-specific platforms very frequently, and use use search engine optimization to help you get found. And also, by the way, this also proactively prevents negative online reputation issues from coming up. So, uh, one, Start analyzing your reputation. You know, flush out all of the background information, especially awards, peer recognition, um, et cetera. Then review, identify, and list all the current content, either online or that's offline. And also, this is important too, know, you know, what are your future goals and the firm's direction. Then two, create content, create good targeted content, and identify key platforms where your clients are on. So these could be blog posts, articles, presentations, white papers, videos, etc. cetera. Uh, three, share, share these very frequently. Take them, share them on platforms, social media platforms, and aim to get good quality followers and engage with them. So that could be LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, uh, slide share, and, and again, we might go into some more details of those. And finally, for search engine optimization, and some of this might get a little bit technical, but 
um, search and develop key search terms. So, for example, you might want to focus on a specific search term such as, you know, matrimonial law mediation NYC rather than something that's really broad like divorce lawyer. And then take this phrase, search term, add it to uh, your current website, add them to the social media and other platforms um, and, and other places. And again, you know, why are we doing this? The whole goal is to maintain maintaining a stellar, great online reputation is crucial because about 90 to 95 percent of all clicks occur on the first page of Google. And clients look for confidence, experience, and reputation. So if there's little information online or if there are negative links, certainly the damage could be significant in terms of lost customers and a decrease in billable hours. So let me pass it on to Bill for the next slides. Thanks. Uh, heading, heading into the next slide, I can speak to uh, some of what, what we've done at my firm in order to try to develop uh, an online reputation. Uh, a main uh, uh, effort that we've had was uh, setting up a blog and promoting content that relates to what we think uh, clients would be interested in and that uh, clients who prospects who are interested in it uh, would be apt to uh, contact us. And in doing so, we've promoted that content not only through our website, but through a variety of other online platforms, including uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Google+, and others. So you could see when someone uh, searches uh, uh, Google that we uh, come up with a good deal of content and a, a number of, of the, the hits all uh, promote uh, our firm's site. So you can see um, it ranges from uh, blog posting to then uh, being promoted throughout the Internet. Uh, and then as that happens, people uh, will find that content contact us and uh, surprisingly or not surprisingly uh, to me as we started to do this people would contact us whether it was a referral from a trusted colleague or someone that found us straight from an internet search telling us how they had seen all this content uh, and mentions of our firm in various different places and it gave them confidence that we were the experts that they were looking for in order to uh, move forward with their project. So we'll move on. I'm going to pass it off to Brian. Okay, Bill. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, let's take a look at our last survey question. Do you or your firm have reviews online? Uh, for those of you that have reviews, that's great to see. You should keep it up. Keep continuing to try and get more reviews. Uh, for those of you that don't, you know, one of the goals of this webinar is to convince you to see how reviews can contribute to your online reputation. Uh, and reviews are really important because of some specific online impacts that we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but generally, just the thing to get across is that reviews have really become pervasive, and they're a key component of how most people evaluate businesses and services. Uh, the days of online reviews being limited to restaurants and hotels are really gone. Uh, nearly every type of business, including professional services like lawyers and doctors, have received and will continue to receive reviews online. Uh, now, reviews are also important because they go beyond what a law firm can say about itself to the public, whether that's through a commercial or through content on your website. Uh, reviews help validate your firm's credibility through comments from the public. Uh, it's like a word-of-mouth recommendation from a friend or colleague. An online review can really be that final push that leads to a potential client uh, to call you over someone else. Uh, now, going back to our chart, uh, looking at the different ways that you can improve your online reputation, uh, ratings and reviews are a final component of this. And reviews contribute 
primarily because they're prominently displayed on search engines like Google. Uh, now, if you do a search on Google and you see a business page that has stars as part of the display, those stars are because there are reviews on that page. And Google recently changed their rules so that those stars can display uh, if a firm or a business has as little as one review. It used to be five reviews before those stars would show, and they dropped it all the way down to one. Uh, and if your firm has good reviews across several different sites like Google, Facebook, Lawyers.com, Yelp, and others, uh, searches for your firm will display these stars throughout the page and really show that you know how people are reviewing you across the Internet. And we're going to look at an example of this with uh, Bill's firm in, in a little bit. Uh, another recent change that Google made was uh, they started to show a reviews from the web section in their business listings. Uh, so in addition to showing their own information and their own reviews, Google is promoting information from other websites like Facebook and like our website, lawyers.com. So this confirms that Google believes that this is information their users want to see. Uh, they don't want to just see reviews from Google. They want to see reviews wherever they can find them, even if they're from other sites. Uh, now, continuing with Google, so you know nobody knows exactly what goes into how Google creates their search results. They keep that very private. Uh, but there are some companies out there, including a very well-respected SEO company called Moz, M-O-Z, uh, that tries to look at it. And they recently released their local search ranking factors for 2017. Uh, now, what they do is they do extensive data research, and they get input from industry experts, and they try and determine what goes into Google's algorithm. And here are some highlights of what Google put together. Uh, so reviews, um, according to Moz, are about 25% more important to the order of Google search results than they were the last time that they published these findings in 2015. Uh, and, and those are not just reviews on Google, by the way. Those are third-party sites as well, like Lawyers.com, Facebook, and others. So uh, having reviews on Google are great, but you want to have reviews in as many places as you can. Uh, Moz also put out a list of what they called competitive difference makers. These are the things that can really differentiate one listing from another. And out of the top 20 of those difference makers, four of them were related to reviews. Just to go over those quickly, number one uh, was quantity. Uh, somewhat obviously, the more reviews you have, the better. Uh, number two was related keywords. So if the reviews include language that relates to what people are searching for, that can help boost that page up in the rankings. Uh, number three, positive sentiment. Again, somewhat obviously, good reviews are better than bad reviews. Um, and number four, uh, what, the, what Moz calls review diversity. So that means having reviews across a variety of sites, not just on one or two. Uh, and another uh, factor that Moz called out as being uh, kind of up and coming in importance is what they call review velocity. And uh, what velocity means is the how frequently reviews come in. Do you get a whole bunch of reviews all at once, or do you get a more steady stream of reviews consistently? Um, and what Moz believes is that what Google sees is as being more likely to be valid is a steady stream of constant reviews as opposed to five reviews within a week and then months later getting another chunk of reviews. So it's important to try and get that steady stream if you can. Uh, I'm now going to turn things back over to Bill, uh, who has some additional thoughts on how his firm has acquired reviews. Thanks. for So uh, it, there can be a little bit of an art and a science to uh, getting reviews. Um, some clients uh, will ask outright, uh, if uh, there's a place that they can provide you reviews. Others, uh, you want to be sensitive to uh, current projects that you have going on, but uh, I, my, my recommendation and what I've found to work is reaching out uh, after we've completed a project uh, for a client, even, even those that we have month in, month out work going on, and saying, uh, you know, dear Frank or dear Sally, uh, we uh, recently were able to navigate uh, the issues that, that we're facing the company and we feel that we got a good result. Um, I was wondering if you would be willing to provide us a review on and then insert whatever uh, platform uh, you think that the review will serve you best. Um, some clients are highly receptive, others uh, 
not as much, but what I would say is that it's it, if you are asking uh, in uh, you know a, a way that is non-offensive, even if someone doesn't have the time, it won't. Uh, it, I, I've never seen it uh, affect uh, an ongoing working relationship, and this is one of those things that. Uh, it doesn't happen unless you ask for it. And uh, so what, I, what I've what i done is uh, crafted some language that I use for different situations and um, had a decent outcome. What I can say is this is always a work in progress. Um, your reputation is never something static but always dynamic and developing. So it takes uh, some consistent energy over time. Hand it back to Brian. Thanks a lot, Bill. Uh, now let's turn our focus to addressing negative reviews. Uh, now nobody really likes to hear or read something negative about them, whether it's themselves or especially their business. Uh, but if you're going to have an online presence, you're likely to have a negative review eventually. What's really important here is how your firm handles it. Uh, now, a negative review can bring down your firm score, and like uh, Steve said earlier, it can potentially have a negative impact, uh, but you don't need to be perfect to get clients. Uh, a recent study, people were asked, you know, what is the star rating you want to see from a business before you'll be willing to interact with them? And the vast majority of people, well over 90%, would be willing to work with a business if that business has a four-star rating. So if you're at 4.1 or 4.2 stars out of 5, you want to keep an eye on it and try and get it higher. Um, if you're at 4.7 or 4.8 because one negative review brought your score down, that does not mean that your business is in serious trouble just because of that one review. But you want to make sure you address it. Uh, so, And the other thing is that negative reviews can really be a blessing in disguise. Uh, they give your firm the opportunity through a, a well-crafted response to that review to publicly demonstrate how you address concerns from customers or clients. You don't want to ignore a review. Uh, you don't want to address it combatively. Uh, you want to um, address it head-on and, like I said, turn that negative into a positive. Uh, now, we're about to look at some strategies for responding to reviews, uh, but when it comes to your online reputation, one thing to always keep in mind is that the response you write is not for the person who wrote the review, but for everyone else who's going to see it in the future and is deciding to contact you or a competitor. So when it comes to actually responding to reviews, the first question, do we need to respond to them at all? And the answer is absolutely yes. You know, As Steve said earlier, one review can have a significant impact unless you do something about it. Um, now, most websites are going to allow companies to have the opportunity to respond to any review, and that lets you provide your side of the story, and as I talked about on the last slide, turn that negative into a positive. Um, and also, people really appreciate businesses that respond to reviews. Uh, there was, again, a recent survey where people were asked what they think about a business when they see it engages with customers who write reviews online. And the top three traits that people said were, number one, they care about their clients. Number two, they have great client service. And number three, that they're trustworthy. So by responding to reviews, you can start to build that reputation with potential clients before you've even ever spoken to them. Now, the second part is how do you respond? Now, we recommend using the them technique, which is four things to consider when responding to reviews. Uh, the, the T in them is for timing. Uh, internally, your firm should have a process for how to address uh, reviews that come in, who's going to actually submit the response, who needs to see it and approve it, uh, whatever other steps you might need. Um, and we do recommend trying to respond to reviews, uh, especially negative reviews, quickly, uh, ideally within one business day if you can. The H and the them is for honesty. If someone at the firm made a mistake, it's okay to acknowledge it and, address, and express a commitment to resolve an issue. Uh, a future potential client is going to appreciate that more than a response that is defensive or combative. Uh, at the same time, though, it's also important to keep reviewers honest. Uh, most websites allow or have a process where reviews can be challenged or reported if they're harassing or inappropriate. Uh, so if there's a negative review that you think might uh, be problematic, you can reach out to the website and that review might be able to be taken down. The E and the them is for empathy. 
you know, when you're developing your response, you want to put yourself in the mind of the reviewer and that potential future client. Um, they're reading your response, considering to hire you. So think about what your response is going to make them think. Uh, you want to try and avoid corporate speak, you know, according to our agreement or the document that you signed stated, things like that. Um, generally, you want to try and leave a potential future client with the impression uh, that you care and you want to resolve any possible dispute. And then the final step in the VEM technique is the message. Uh, as our parents all said to us when we were younger, it's not what you say, but how you say it. And before you submit your response, you really want to try and put yourself in the place of that future reader and just ask yourself one question. Does this response make me more likely to contact this law firm? If the answer is no, then you need to go back and work on it some more until the answer is yes. Uh, now, generally with these negative reviews, the first instinct is often to react defensively or think that the person who wrote it is wrong or doesn't understand the situation. Uh, but your response should really try and ignore those things and focus on three elements about your business. Number one, you're responsive and you're dependable. Number two, that you care about client service. And number three, that your goal is to resolve issues. Uh, now we're going to take a step back from reviews, and I'm going to turn it back over to Steve, who has a case study showing how a firm can repair their online reputation. Yeah, great. Thanks, Brian. That is really fantastic. That, that makes so much sense. But, yeah, let's take a look at a, a real-world case study. So I just worked with a small matrimonial-focused law firm in New York who had uh, a lot of growth, had some good wins, um, had a great founder who had 25 years experience, but recently clients stopped calling um, and he reached out to me and uh, the situation seemed to be dire. And so since the first thing that people do, prospects do, clients, uh, even if they do come through a personal referral, is conduct a Google search. So that's what I did. And nothing, thankfully, nothing negative showed up for the lawyer or for the firm. So that's good. But also on the other hand, and this is actually important, nothing very positive came up as well. So on the first page there was the firm's website on top, so that's good and as expected, as well as LinkedIn and Avo. But after that, there was negligible or little else in the form of positive law-related links. Um, there was a discussion group and a fitness website and several other non-law sites. And so think about how you know, a prospective client were searching online, for them it was probably hard to tell if um, that firm really had an active practice even, was not an expert in matrimonial law or both. So what I did was I set out to help create an online reputation for him that represented and translated his 25-year experience to be more prominent on the web. And, you know, this does two things. It shows him as a legitimate, trustworthy lawyer and that he was actually an expert in his field in matrimonial law. So just to go into a few details here, um, really started with LinkedIn. and But even before I could start with that, I needed to do a lot of research on his background, so that included his career, his education, you know, his past. And I took a lot of research to get all the details right, but that's, you know, really, really important. So from that, I was able to add, like, previous jobs to his LinkedIn profile, update all of those sections on LinkedIn with complete information, edit content, um, rewrite his bio, uh, and, and importantly, add links back to his site and also post a, a few previously published articles. Next, writing a Wikipedia article is a really great way to build an online a legal or any online reputation because it's perceived as authoritative and it usually comes up very, very high in search results, usually number one or two, but it's also a hard task. So I started from the updated bio, detailed bio that I created for LinkedIn, and then pared that down to highlights and to items that had external verifiable references. Uh, Twitter. So there I added a brief bio tag focused on matrimonial log, updated images, 
but also importantly, I, I added maybe about 20 initially key legal followers and made several initial tweets pointing back to the firm's site and to other articles, among other things. And in, in his case, he already had an account with Martindale and Lawyers.com, so I made updates to his bio, links, and contact section. Um, for SlideShare, that's an important site, and he already had some existing presentations, so I updated, uh, uploaded, the, uploaded those. That's really important. Uh, Crunchbase also is powerful, and created an account there, added some links and some of those already published articles. And on Google+, Plus, frankly, this could be more important for gaining a better Google search ranking, but I created an account there with bio, links, images. Same thing for YouTube, but added several videos that he had that were about the firm. Um, Medium.com is a great platform, so publish some articles there. So the next step, basically, repeat, you know, because... Um, as was mentioned before, setting up the platforms is really just the first step because it's, it's an ongoing process. Uh, and so the next and most important step is continuing to be active, sometimes every day, on some of these platforms, such as Twitter. And, uh, you know, how long does this take? Well, within the first week, I saw changes in, in this case, but it really depends on the initial assessment, like that form that we saw at the beginning in, in an earlier slide, but on average, the reputation building uh, or the repair process could take, you know, three to four months to up to six months. And I will pass it on back to the moderator. All right. Great. Thank you so much. So now we are going to go on to our Q&A, and just as a reminder, if you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A part of your console. <clears throat> we will try to get to them during this event, but if we don't get to your question, you may receive an email response. So the first question that I have, and this is for Bill, do you use any software or services to help you push your blog out to all of your social media profiles? Uh, yeah, this is Bill. I, I actually uh, use a service um, that helps us with uh, the blogging. Um, they're a marketing company. Um, we work with them on uh, drafting and finalizing the blog, and then they post it, and then they, they do what they call promote it uh, on various platforms. So it's done by them uh, automatically well. Uh, once the entry is drafted. Great. The next question that we have is, how does the them process intersect with attorney-client privilege? Uh, I'll take that one. This is Brian. Um, so, sure, you know, when you're writing a response, you, you can't get too much into the details of the case um, or the situation um, when you're addressing that because of attorney-client privilege, but it's okay to be general. Uh, you know, one example, we had recently a lawyer uh, had a negative review on one of our sites where the client was basically saying they couldn't agree on anything, the lawyer wouldn't do anything they wanted. And the lawyer said to us that they worked really hard with them, but they just, the, the, anything that the client wanted to do with the lawyer just didn't feel was appropriate, they just ended up going their separate ways. Uh, and the response we suggested uh, basically said, you know, we worked extensively with this client, um, but we weren't able to agree on a strategy, so we agreed to part ways. You know, I wish them well. Uh, you know, please see our other client reviews for examples of the services we offer. Uh, so you're addressing the issue the person brought up without being too negative or giving details of what they were asking for, uh, but saying that, you know, you tried the best we could. It didn't work out. You hope things go well for them, um, and kind of directing people to other reviews if you have them. Uh, so you know you can be general um, and not get into details so that you're you should be avoiding issues with attorney-client privilege um, while you know kind of trying to address the address the issue or the concern that the the client brings up. Great, thank you. The next question that we have is. 
We are five stars on Google. We have one nasty review on Yelp who, due to their policies, only show that one bad review and not the dozen other five-star reviews we have on Yelp. We responded, but how does that undo Yelp's policies? I, I guess I'll grab this one again. This is Brian. Um, so, you know, first of all, putting the response is great. Um, so that's one thing you want to do. Um, one thing I would recommend is that if you only have the one review on Yelp, it may be worth um, in part of your future processes of, you know, asking clients for reviews or if people ask you that, that they want to submit a review, where can they do it? Maybe try and direct people towards Yelp to try and get some more reviews on there. Um, you know, companies are really only going to show reviews that are submitted on their site. Facebook's only going to show Facebook. Yelp's only going to show Yelp. Lawyers.com is only going to show Lawyers.com. Uh, but if you can try and direct some people towards Yelp, uh, you may get some additional reviews to balance that out. And that will really help because if you have five or six other strong reviews and then this one that's negative, uh, people can see it as an outlier. Uh, which can be really beneficial for you too. And, you know, you kind of turn that negative, as I've said before during the, during the discussion, into a positive because people will see, okay, one person had a little bit of a problem with them, but there's a whole bunch of other reviews here that are very positive. Uh, so if you can try and direct some clients towards Yelp or towards any other website where there may be that one bad review and get more of a balance, uh, you'll be in a better place. Yeah, and this is Steve. If I can just jump in for one second, I think all that makes sense. And uh, this is not uncommon in my experience with Yelp. There are problems that things, for some reason, there's an algorithm that Yelp has that tends to block even positive or legitimately good reviews. Uh, you know, so I guess that's something we have to live with and just focus on the other platforms. You know, continually to uh, continue to build good content uh, elsewhere. Great, thank you. Uh, one question that we had from the audience that ties into what we're talking about right now is by reviews, do you mean an actual written statement or just stars? Because places like Lawyers.com and Martindale make the appearance of star ratings based on the AVBD rating, but then you look and the lawyer has no actual review, just the stars. Uh, thanks for bringing this one up. This is Brian again. I really wanted to address this one. Um, you know, so. What Lawyers.com and Marndale.com have is uh, we have a number of attorneys who earned their peer review uh, rating several years ago before we changed our, our survey um, and added things like numerical scores uh, and practice areas and other parts of the, the current survey. Uh, so someone who got their rating before then, we don't, you know, the individual reviews we have don't have that level of detail, so we don't show them. Uh, but they have the, the stars that are part of a, a score that they were provided when we change the survey. But there will be attorneys, if you go on our websites, that definitely have um, individual reviews. And that's only for peer reviews, by the way, too. Uh, our websites also have a number of reviews uh, from clients. And those for each review, you will see all of the details, the, the stars, uh, whether or not the client recommends their service, um, written feedback, or other information that they provided. Um, so on our websites, you may see some people who have stars but no other details, uh, but we're definitely making more efforts to encourage more attorneys to get reviews so that everybody has that detail because that's really important uh, for their benefit. People are looking for more than just the stars. Uh, they want to see those individual reviews and that content. Uh, so we're trying to do what we can to encourage more people to get involved in that. Great, thank you. The next question that we have is, approximately how many hours per month do you recommend an attorney spend on promoting online reputation in the absence of negative reviews or other negative online content? Uh, well, this is Steve. I'll just jump in briefly. Um, you know, it's really an ongoing process. I mean, I, uh, you know, maybe Bill can talk to this too. I mean, you know, it might be an hour a week. Uh, you know, spread over, you know, writing content or writing an article um, and then sharing that, taking some time to share that. But, you know, it's really more is better, but, um, you know, it's just an ongoing process. It, th this is Bill. I, I, I mean, I think that it can depend on, on the practice. Um, 
but I would say at least an hour a week um, for putting content out, uh, engaging your audience. Uh, you want to have uh, fresh uh, content or commentary uh, out there. Great, thank you. Next question is, can attorneys provide reviews for other attorneys, and will Google consider this a negative? Uh, this is Brian. I'll, I'll jump in on that one. So, you know, Martindale Hubble has the, the peer reviews that have been around for well over a century, and there's no negative uh, from Google on ours. I mean, in fact, you know, we're one of the few sites that Google pulls reviews from for their reviews from the web section. Um, and they pull peer and client reviews from that. So we don't see any situation where they consider that a negative. Um, now, most sites, I think, are typically reviews from clients or people who work with the firm, but uh, our websites have peer reviews, and then LinkedIn has endorsements, which would typically come from peers. Uh, I think in most cases, while other sites, the reviews are typically from clients, whether it's, it's uh, Google or Facebook or Yelp. Um, but we have no experience that Google sees reviews from fellow attorneys as a negative. Great, thanks. Next question that we have is, I think I have a good reputation, but the reputation of the firm I'm with is mixed. Any suggestions? Uh, well, this is Steve. Maybe I'll jump in for a second on that. Um, yeah, that could be... You know, I'm not sure if there's a big um, – I don't know if I have any direct thoughts on that. I mean, on the one hand, they might be directly contacting you as a lawyer. I guess it depends. Like if they're connecting to you directly, let's say, through a recommendation, and then they look for you and they have a level of trust, then, you know, they that's something that they, you know, would feel comfortable with. And then if they – look at the firm's reputation online, then they might have some questions. So maybe there's a way to address that in a conversation with them or maybe even try to bring it up with um, the people at the firm and say there's, you know, look at ways to improve the reputation of the firm. And lastly, when, you know, as the lawyer in the firm, you know, maybe um, add the firm's name and information that you push out you know, if you're writing articles and, you know, just make sure that's prominent because then that will also help the firm's reputation. So I guess those are just some, some thoughts. Great. Thank you. The next question is, what do you recommend for a young attorney to boost their credibility and online reputation since they may have limited experience? Uh, this is Steve. Maybe I'll just uh, touch on that for a minute, too. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really, uh, I would just suggest, you know, writing good content, good articles, connect with and engage with um, people online or, or follow key followers on Twitter. And doing all these things will eventually, you know, maybe after several months, um, you know, build an online reputation for you and, and hopefully, you know, have you be considered as an expert, you know, as more articles that you write appear online, you know, the more chance that people will say, oh, well, this person looks like they know what they're doing, knows what they're talking about, and, you know, that's, that's a way to start to, you know, to build and to have people to come to you and to see you as the expert and to focus on, you know, like a, a really specific topic that, you know, answers a question and that legitimately, you know, focuses on, uh, someone's concern or something that's in the news or something that's a real issue that helps people. This is Bill. Uh, just to jump in, as uh, as someone that started as a young lawyer, uh, kind of uh, on their own doing this, um, I would say one strategy can be uh, taking a look at content that's already out there and uh, Put, putting it out onto platforms uh, that where you think it would engage an audience, perhaps adding commentary, perhaps even just sharing that article from, let's say, uh, TechCrunch, uh, the New York Times, what, whatever whatever the the subject matter might be, uh, and 
it, 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 you can start to put, put out uh, and create a reputation for sharing important information. And then in turn, as that rolls forward, start writing and creating content that sort of integrates with what you're already sharing. And surprisingly or not surprisingly, people uh, take notice. They'll start to follow. Yeah, definitely. Um, along those lines, here's an audience question. How do we promote our blogs or when we write articles? Uh, yeah, this is Steve. Um, well, there's a couple of ways. The, the first way, probably one of the best ways, is if you have established platforms or channels, share them there. So again, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, law specific sites, um, you know, wherever you have uh, these connections or platforms, share about it with the link back to that article or back to that blog or back to your blog. Um, and, you know, maybe write several with several different kind of tidbits. It's really just sort of like a brief headline that you're pushing out there. Um, and do something that's engaging so that will, you know, again, pique their interest, show that you're legitimate, show that you really are answering a question or, like, get to the real heart of whatever that sort of the thesis of that blog or article is. And, yeah, share it. And share it with the right people, too. Identify, again, like sort of key followers, key, you know, people in your niche perhaps. Follow them as well, um, maybe even reach out to them and say, hey, you know, thought this might be of interest. Um, and even sort of offline, maybe do an email uh, to a select few of people. Hey, you know, was thinking of you. Here's an article that I wrote might be of interest. You know, things like that can help also. Great. Here's a question that's pretty timely and relevant. Does a 10-year-old false news story that stays on the Internet keep the statute of limitations from running because it's being published every day? I'll jump in. This is Brian. I don't know if we have any um, defamation, libel, or slander experts on the call, so I, I don't know for sure. Um, my, my guess would be that, you know, the date that it was actually put on the internet would be considered the publication date. Um, I have not heard of any cases or anything where a statute of limitations tolls because it's still on the internet. Um, but I'm, you know, not an expert on this, so uh, I, I don't know if anyone else has any um, experience with this. So, unfortunately, I'm not sure about this one. Yeah, and this is Steve. I'll just uh, ha add a brief comment. Yeah, the legal side, not really sure about that, but. You know, way doesn't. I mean, suppress it. You know, the way the 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 thought is, you know, do you want to go through a legal battle over that and still have to get rid of it because the person might not, you know, might be impossible to take down, uh, you know, through a court or legal approach. Uh, so usually, what I do again, this is you know, on the repair side, repairing something, I. Uh, suppress it and push it down off the first or second page in Google search results. And since like 90 to 95 percent of people go to the first page and don't go beyond the second page, that's making it disappear. So unfortunately, that's you know all too common these days of you know, trying to suppress something. All right. Next question that we have is: There are instances when disparaging remarks are made in public with the intent to discourage others or simply as a part of negative gossip. What are some effective, timely ways to counteract these situations? Um, yeah, this is Steve. Uh, you know, it's really um, kind of the same thing of, of building a reputation as, as to sort of counteract negative, you know, potentially, you know, gossipy or, you know, just negative items that are out there. You know, um, make sure that, uh, you know, write content, make sure that you, your name or the firm's name or, you know, whatever is being, uh, you know, quoted in these negative uh, uh, articles or whatever are included in um, 
in those uh, articles that you write or blog posts. You know, really writing a blog, if you have a website, you know, if you don't, you know, really make sure you have a website or having a website with your domain is really powerful, is really helpful. And then, um, you know, writing these uh, blogs, you know, quickly, you know, same thing, sharing it in the right places. And as I mentioned earlier, one good other source is uh, medium.com, just for example, is a site that I think has good quality content on there and is not, um, uh, you know, doesn't have a lot of spam or a lot of, you know, kind of crappy stuff that's out there and it's usually, a, usually shows up high. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned earlier too, Wikipedia, if there's a way to write a Wikipedia article, you know, that's really, really helpful and really shows that you're an expert and that shows up really quickly. Google highly ranks it. Uh, usually shows up like number one or number two. Um, and lastly, also, you know, just make sure your LinkedIn profile is up to date. That's something that's really quick and can show can show up really quickly and is you know can take just a few hours to update. All right. Next question is: What do you suggest if your jurisdiction restricts lawyer advertising and does not allow references or recommendations on social media? Uh, this is Brian. So, so obviously in this case, and one thing you know we do want to bring up, obviously you need to check your local uh, state bar rules regarding any concerns, whether it's uh, you know soliciting reviews or anything like that. Um, when it comes to um, your local state, you know if you know your state does have those sort of restrictions, um, you know you may not be able to ask people for reviews or promote ones that you get on other websites. Um, you know, Steve, maybe you can jump in here, but I think that might be worth suggesting then focusing on some of the other things that Steve talked about, whether it's making sure you have a blog or posting presentations you're part of or things like that, just to have other ways to get content out there. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. And and just like, you know, see what, what good content is out there and promote that or either unpublished things, you know, presentations that you have or other information that's around that you can publish is really helpful. All right. Next question is, um, Yelp says not to ask for reviews. So how can you direct people to Yelp without breaking Yelp's policies? This is uh, this is Brian. So I, I did look this up, and I think what what Yelp says when they say don't ask for reviews is they they're not directing um, if a bunch of people who don't have accounts just come on, create an account, and submit one review. Uh, Yelp wants to focus on regular reviewers. So you know while they definitely encourage businesses because I've I've been in them that have those review us on Yelp stickers or stand up displays. Um, as part of the business so that someone who's on Yelp will then, you know, go there. Um, you know, if at least to get some content on there, I think it may be helpful as a short-term thing, but it seems like one thing that Yelp does not want people to do is just kind of an email blast where if they get a whole bunch of reviews from new accounts um, within a short period of time. But if you present Yelp as an option, among other places where you can submit reviews. You know, we've seen firms or people having their email signature, review us on Facebook, review us on Yelp, review us on Google with links to those pages. Uh, so that way, people who are on Yelp will go there. Um, but in those circumstances, you may not want to, you know, do an email blast or contact a large group of people to all do reviews on Yelp in a short period of time. All right, next question, and we've touched on this a little bit, but the question is, how does one combat the front page news and coverage of a deeply flawed arrest for a felony? The local coverage, I mean, I'm sorry, the local newspaper and media outlets are very strong influences on any result. I know another lawyer who got his record expunged, and that only caused more bad press. Yeah, this is Steve. I'll uh, maybe tackle that one. Yeah, it's it's... It's a long slog. It's not easy. It's, um, you know, especially like with newspaper sources or, you know, even, you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, those are really hard or like anything with .gov or .sec you know, or, you know, any of those kind of things. 
are hard to suppress and push down. So those might take, you know, six months to, uh, to, to do. And it's, you know, really all of the things we've been talking about, it's like really targeted content. Um, and also, you know, I, I believe in second chances and, you know, who knows what has happened with someone in the past. And so, you know, I always try to help or, you know, give, uh, give good advice. So, yeah, it's really, it just takes a long time. It is possible. It might take even a year to do. Um, and also just to be important to be careful and nimble with, you know, the last thing you want to do is create a hornet's nest and, and make things worse. So sometimes you have to lock down comments on Facebook or, you know, put some initial things out there and, you know, really monitor right away what the response is to see if there is some negative additional response. So it, it really depends on the situation, but that's something uh, to be aware of. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And this was a great discussion. We had a lot of audience questions. Um, so if we did not get to your question, then you may receive an email response. So please be looking out for that. But we have just a few minutes left. So I'd like to go ahead and pass it back over to Brian um, and Steve to do uh, a little bit more information. So Brian. Thanks. Uh, so one thing we wanted to talk about here is, you know, we've talked about how to start an online reputation, what it means, why it's important. Uh, I just want to talk briefly about how to monitor it. Uh, you know, one of the questions was, do you Google yourself and nearly everyone said yes. It's one thing to maybe try and do regularly just to keep an idea on what's out there. Um, but also even more important than that could be Google Alerts. Uh, you need a Google account to do this, but they're free if you don't have one. Uh, and you can set up alerts for your name or for your firm name. Uh, and then you will get a daily email with any new links or articles online that reference you or reference your firm. Uh, so that way if something negative does pop up, you can start to address it. Uh, if there's something positive, an article or something that you weren't aware of that mentions you or your firm, you can promote it out there um, just to help build your reputation. Uh, you also want to make sure to check online reviews, and the best way to do that is to claim profiles. Um, hopefully everyone on the call knows, but just in case you don't, you know, sites like Yelp and Google and Facebook can create business listings for your firm without your knowledge. Uh, if there's publicly available information out there, whether it's the State Bar website or a Yellow Pages listing or any sort of publicly available information about your firm or your business, Google and often other websites will create a listing for you, and people can review you on that listing, and you may not know about it. Uh, but what you can do is you can claim that listing. You can confirm that you're the business. I know Google usually sends a postcard or something to the address to make sure that you're the actual owner. Uh, but once you confirm you're the owner and you take control of that profile, you will then get notified when new reviews get published so you can make sure to address them quickly. So that's really important. Uh, and then there are also a number of other services out there that can help monitor your reputation. You know, Steve obviously helps with recovery, uh, but then there are other services out there, you know, Mention, TalkWalker, other examples where you can just get information um, for third-party companies that can help you monitor your reputation on an ongoing basis. Uh, and now I'll uh, pass it over to Steve just for some closing comments. Yeah, thanks so much. And I the Google Alerts is really, really a great idea and really is really helpful. So again, just to you know summarize what we've been talking about, you know, really building a positive online reputation. Uh, best way to do that is you know just create good quality content, information, share it frequently in the right places. You know, flooding the internet with quality content does eventually show your expertise and, or pushes down something negative and pushes it down off the first page. And Online reputation building, you know, draws clients in by building trust, showing you are an expert in your practice area. And that results in more traffic and then more clients. And it translates years of experience, background, and successes to the web. And also remember, if a client or prospect searches for you or your firm but finds little there, they could or probably will move on to someone else because they are not perceived as, as an expert. And also, of course, if something negative shows up, especially on the first page of Google search results, clients or prospects, stop calling. You know, negative in, information online can discourage 
you know, potential customers or existing clients from contacting you or with working with you again. So again, the best solution is to generate positive content and reviews that reflect your real good reputation and then share this on industry-specific platforms frequently. So thank you so much. And I'll pass it back to the moderator. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined us. That's about all the time that we have, and we hope that this was valuable to you. Um, as a reminder, if you asked a question and you didn't get a response here, you may receive an email response. Also, there are several resources for download. And we would like to thank our panelists, Steve Giovinco, Bill Samuels, and Brian Veter. And thank you so much to Martindale Nolo for your support. Just as a reminder, this presentation will be archived so that you can refer to it later. Thanks, and have a great afternoon.